Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Writers Unlimited, the series. You may know Writers Unlimited from the annual festival in January in the, across the street in Theater at Spau. And s since now, I think two years now, we organize these monthly literary evenings with foreign writers coming over to the Netherlands, introducing their work. We're very happy with you being here, but although you're not in hundreds of people, you must realize that after this evening, you, later you can say, I was there when Katie Royfe was introduced with her new novel. And not only is here Katie Royfe from the US, but Manon Uphoff, you may know her name, of course. She's one of our best writers in the Netherlands, which won so many prizes that I won't mention them all. Her latest book is here. And this is, of course, the Dutch translation, which is this evening being introduced to you, Lof van het Rommelige Leven. The evening will be all in English, so if you don't understand English, please ask your neighbor to translate. <laughs> Why do we have Katie Royfe here? And I must, because I had Manon on the phone, I think it was summer in summer, and how are you going, Manon? I'm reading this book, it's incredible. Uh, uh, it's in English. It's going to be translated, I think, uh, but she's wonderful. We should invite her. So we invited Katie. And here they are, Manon Uphoff and Katie Royfe. Welcome. Uh, a warm welcome to you. No, oh, thank you. Katie Royfe. We already met and had a small conversation in uh, the cafeteria on the other side of the street which was very nice. Uh, before we will start our, our conversation, uh, the interview, um, I uh, um, have to, to say a few thank yous. Um, the first one, I think, is to uh, Writers Unlimited, who made this evening uh, uh, possible. Uh, the library, of course, who um, gives us the space to have these uh, uh, monthly talks, or two monthly talks, monthly. Monthly, and um, uh, of course, um, our shared publishing house, uh, the Busy Bee. Um, now, I, I already we, we already discussed. It, it's possible that that uh, you might doze off <laughs> during the interview because you were on 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 the plane at six o'clock. Yesterday, I got on the plane. Oh, no, yeah. yesterday night in New York, I got uh -huh, on the plane. Uh -huh. I don't even know what time it is right now. You're really but confused. I've been up for the whole. Long, long day. But you know, you know in which country you are. I do. Okay, luckily. Um, your book, um, In Praise of Messy Lives, was um, the New York Times best book uh, of the year. Um, I uh, read it a couple of months ago, and I was um, blown away by it. Um, it's a, a series of, uh, of essays uh, about... Uh, the messiness of our lives and um, why uh, we maybe should praise this messiness more. We discussed if there is a difference between messiness and sloppiness because I tend to confuse them and use them uh, both, but you say there is a, a very big difference between those two. Well, sloppiness is kind of always, always negative and messiness is pretty much always negative. So <laughs> sloppiness being like really, really, really negative and messiness being quite negative, I think is the difference. Sloppiness being kind of lazy and like your room is sloppy or your work is shoddy and that kind of thing. Could you, could you explain um, to the audience what is a messy life? What makes a life messy? So just that we can compare it to the lives that are not so messy. <laughs> well, I, thought I wasn't going to get into my own life this quickly, but very quickly. I started to write this book because I kind of, um, I was living, I tried to live a conventional, traditionally stable life, and I just spectacularly failed at that conventional life. So I think of myself as a kind of failed conventional person. And my life started, I sort of was liberated by these failures into ever more colorful failures of conventional life. So I have two children with two different dads, neither of whom I live with. And over time, my life just got, fell a little bit outside of the kind of, and I think here it's a little different than it is in the US. But in the US, if you're not married and you have children, that's pretty bad. And it's kind of 
outside of what we think of as acceptable. So I started this book as a kind of exploration or a defense or a celebration of that messiness um, that I was kind of drawn to or compelled by in some way. And I, and I really wanted the book to kind of question um, our ideas of what a good life is. Because I feel like in America, at least, and I think in other places too, we've gotten to have a sort of narrow idea of what is an acceptable way to be a parent, what is an acceptable way to structure a family, what is an acceptable, you know, down to like the organic milk that we're giving our children. Everything, it has to look a certain way and be a certain way. And I was just sort of thinking about maybe it's better if we stop trying to live according to this definition of perfection that may not be that perfect after all. So that was kind of the core of the book. And was that also because I, I can imagine you, you yourself felt personally a little bit hurt by uh, uh, the way people uh, approach uh, the sloppiness or the messiness of your, of your life, um, so-called. Um, but did you also write a book because um, you, you say uh, it's titled In Praise of, of Messy Life. It's like you want to embrace something that we have lost. And in uh, the interview in uh, the Dutch newspaper, the Volkskrant, you say it seems as if we are uh, um, craving for, for clichés. And um, mm -hmm. what kind of clichés are we craving, craving for? And well, I think I, um, in a certain way, there's been a lot of social change over the past several decades. We look at women's equality. We look at all kinds of social upheaval of the traditional ways that people were living in, say, 1950. And I think that that upheaval creates a lot of anxiety. And so we, we have a new kind of conservatism now. And I guess the, the cliches I was talking about is that sometimes our conservatism now, and this is something I explore in this book in sort of the liberal New York world I live in, um, which is the conservatism we express doesn't take the forms that it used to. It's not as obvious. It's much subtler. So people are, their judgments of other people take a much more, they take sort of these wily, subtle forms. And, and it's that that I was trying to kind of unearth. So rather than say, you know, it's wrong to be a single mother, people find ways of expressing that it's wrong that, that are very kind of painful and knife-like, but they just aren't overt in that way. And I think our, our new idea um, and the new cliches are much more about living a healthy life, um, living a liberal, progressive, enlightened life. We have all these ideas of what this new kind of bourgeois good life is. And I talk a lot about parenting, you know, so giving your kids 16 different lessons and taking them to Mandarin lessons and um, you know, not letting them walk to school on their own till they're 15 years old, and you know, just sort of hovering over our children and kind of, you know, making them the center of our lives. The French feminist Elizabeth Bedinter calls it l'enfant roi, the child is king. So that idea that the child has to be king and that certain adult facets of adult life are sort of obscured and lost. Um, and I should say that I actually came up with the title of this book because in this sort of hackish journalistic way, which is I was. Somebody asked me to write a piece about Mad Men, the series. And um, I had not watched a single episode of Mad Men, and I had to watch all of the episodes that had gone in like one day or two days or something, so just back-to-back -back Mad Men. And I was trying to figure out, what is, why are we so interested in this? Why do we want to see like nine-year-old girls mixing a Tom Collins and pregnant women smoking and all this adultery and people drinking scotch in the middle of the day in their offices and everyone falling into bed with everybody? Why, are, why does every time somebody does something sort of excessive and early 60s-ish, it gives us this thrill and it gives us this free song? So why are all these you know, upstanding, nice, liberal people who aren't cheating on their spouses and don't drink too much and they get up in the morning to exercise and they're eating like organic fennel at the farm, you know, <laughs> restaurant and every, they're living these pretty orderly lives. Why do they want to see this madman? Why are they obsessed with madman? Why can't they get enough of it? And I know it's kind of caught on here too, I take it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, it, that's what it started with and I, and I started to just write I, I, I thought I was going to analyze the phenomenon, but it ended up being like a in praise of. It just came out that way, and so that was the beginning of the book. 
I, I'd like to go to a, a small fragment of Mad Men. Uh, Tom, maybe you can start first YouTube. Uh, uh, it's about Roger Sterling's uh, second divorce. I don't know if you uh, have watched uh, Mad Men, but uh, uh, Roger Sterling is my favorite. Oh, I love Roger <laughs> Sterling. Uh, yeah, you, you, uh, <laughs> I mean, you should love him. He's, he's really adorable. Is it morning? Yes. I'm sorry I always say it, but you are so beautiful. Last night was beautiful. It was, wasn't it? Where are you going? Out the door and into the elevator, I suppose. What about me? You can take your time. Obviously. But I figured I'd just check into a hotel for a while. I don't want to displace you. What are you talking about? I imagined all this screaming and fighting and lawyers. and It's just so beautiful. How we were able to be there together. In the truth. Like you wanted. Are you leaving me? No. We're leaving each other, just like you said. I didn't say that. You did. You said so many amazing things. You were speaking German. I don't know German. You were quoting your father. It must have been Yiddish. But I was on drugs. I obviously didn't mean any of it. So your psychiatrist didn't tell you that you knew this was over, but you were waiting for me to say it? I did say that. It's good that you did, because we both knew it. No. I don't know. It's going to be very expensive. I know. how it ends with it's going to be very expensive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but but I, I think in, in this fragment, we, we can already uh, see what, what can be the appeal of a certain, certain kind of, uh, of, of messiness. But maybe um, um, just to, to add a little bit to that, you can uh, read for us a fragment of uh, an essay uh, uh, titled The Perverse Allure of Messy Lives, which deals with uh, madmen uh, also. Um, okay. Uh, I remember being at a Paris review party at George Plimpton's house nearly four decades after my mother was one of the girls draped across the couch when he commented dryly, those were wilder days when your mother was here. And the wildness he was talking about had a certain ideological cast. It was, among other things, a critique of conventional life, a refusal to accept the values of the lonely crowd, a rebellion against the well-heeled well organization man. But even in literary or artistically inclined circles, our relation to mainstream bourgeois values are different now, more wishful and embracing than rebellious. Where my mother's novelist friends were determined to defy moral convention, the novelist we currently admire sells his novel to the movies, lives in a townhouse in Brooklyn or a loft in Tribeca, and has a good car. His bohemianism and rebellion against conventional mores basically confined to shopping at Whole Foods. It's a very fancy organic store. With, with a life, in short, that suspiciously resembles that of the banker or advertising executive next door. In Mad Men, there's a scene in which Betty Draper lies in the bath reading Mary McCarthy's bestseller, The Group, and it is McCarthy who perhaps wrote most frankly about the allure and embarrassment and comedy of the messy life. In her intellectual memoirs, which were not exactly that, she recalls one 24-hour period in which she slept with three different men. Though, quote, though slightly scared by what things were coming to, I didn't feel promiscuous. Perhaps no one ever does. Out of curiosity, I once parsed how much McCarthy drank in the course of a particular night. 
three daiquiris, two Manhattans, a couple of glasses of red wine, which she, by the way, refers to as Dago Red, then some Benedictine and brandies. Those nights often involve regret, but she writes about them with such exuberance, such festive humor, that one can see how seductive messiness can be. Juxtaposed against all this flamboyance, the tameness of contemporary sins can be a little disheartening. Try telling a group of young parents in a Draper-like milieu that you have decided to give your baby non-organic milk instead of paying $4 for organic, or give a toddler an M&M to quiet them down in front of a gaggle of stay-at-home moms. They're only baby teeth, a friend of mine once said and see what sort of unbridled disapproval you can elicit. It seems that some of us are so busy channeling our energies into doing what is good for us, for our children, into responsible and improving endeavors that we may have forgotten somewhere in the harried trips to express yourself through theater or Trader Joe's to seize the day. Of course, people still have hangovers and affairs, but what dominates the wholesome vista is a sense that everything we do should be productive, should be moving toward a sane and balanced end, toward the dubious and fragile illusion of quote-unquote healthy. The idea that you would do something just for the momentary blissful escape of it, for intensity, for strong feeling, is out of fashion. When we talk about the three martini lunch these days, it is with a sort of dismissive contempt, tinged with a pleasurable thrill of superiority. How much more sensible we are than them? How much healthier? How much more prolific? How did anyone get any work done? Someone will invariably ask. But maybe that's the wrong question. Or maybe the kind of work they got done was a different kind of work. Or maybe that is not the highest and holiest standard to which we can hold the quality of human life. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, do you yourself have an explanation, because I think this is very, we can all relate to this, it's very recognizable, even the situation in America and New York uh, changes uh, from uh, the one in the Netherlands, but I, I think there's this overall sensation that we are trying to control our lives. Mm -hmm. um, but if this sloppiness, messiness uh, has so much uh, uh, attraction in it, how come that we don't give in to this attraction? How come that we are no longer Roger Sterling's or, or uh, second wives or third wives uh, just uh, saying, oh, it's <coughs> going to be very, very expensive? <laughs> what has changed? Um, it's really hard to say, and I, and I just want to say as a caveat, um, I don't romance, my mo I hear like my mother's voice buzzing <laughs> around my head somewhere. Um, she would be saying, you're romanticizing those old parties, you know, and, and back when like everyone was falling in bed with everyone. She tells a story about my older sister where my older sister was 16 months old at one of these literary parties. She spent all her time like the parents would put her on a pile of coats. So she would like sleep all night till they left at like four in the morning on a pile of coats. And at 16 months or 18 months, she was sitting on the lap of a famous actor who was at one of these parties, very glamorous New York center. And um, 16 months or 18 months, she, she looks up at it and says, you smell like scotch. <laughs> and that's just like a little vignette of, you know, how we don't want to raise our child these days. Um, another story my mother has, I'll be really quick on this one. She was sleeping with a married, she was sleeping with a married man who had four children of his own. And he was one of the founders of this literary magazine, The Paris Review. His name was Doc Humes, and he was psychotic. He was having a psychotic episode. So... He calls her up in the middle of the night and says, her husband's left her for some other woman. It's like this. John Berryman wrote a poem where he said the party, he described the parties of this period. He said, somebody slapped someone's second wife somewhere. It's a great line. <laughs> anyway, so in that Berryman milieu, somebody slapped someone's second wife somewhere. Um, so he's having a nervous breakdown. My mother's home with her own three-year-old. And so he calls her, it's like 3 a.m., and he's like, I need you to come over because flames are consuming my face. So she gets in the cab with the three-year-old in her arms and goes to his house, and there's, like, pot and beer, and she puts the baby on the bed with the, like, beer-soaked sheets. And the man has four children, and wife is, like, in another apartment somewhere. And she convinces him that he needs to go to Bellevue because he thinks his face is being followed by, swallowed by flames. And finally, it's like long, long, many hours. And the child is like up, chatter, chatter, chatter. And the guy thinks his face is being, he's a great poet, he's a brilliant novelist, he's like a gifted artist, but who cares? And then she puts 
My sister, the three-year-old in the back seat of the cab, she finally convinces him to go to Bellevue. She drops him at Bellevue in the emergency room to admit himself to a psychiatric institution, and then she takes my sister to preschool drop-off <laughs> and sends her off to school. And I think about my world, and I do not see a lot of mothers taking their children to preschool drop-off in that world. So I just want to say that I do not romanticize that. Mm -hmm. And I see that there was a lot of, like, in that period, in those artistic circles, there was some violence and destruction to some small people. So I, I don't romanticize it. But I think that our reaction against it, mm -hmm. and that what we see is, I, and I don't think anybody can really say why we have become so conservative in our, in our lifestyle, <clears throat> but our reaction is so extreme to this messiness, that the neatness we have created in its stead is pretty oppressive, and I think also a little bit violent and destructive to the creative spirit of the people moving forward. And, um, and so I'm not really sure why, and some people have made the argument that these children felt sort of resentful about working mothers, and so they decided they're going to be a different kind of mother, and even if they're working, they're going to make, get up at five in the morning and make the beautiful cupcake because they want their children to have this old-fashioned childhood that they didn't have. So, so that's also compensation. their, their uh, 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 response to their romantic ideal of the mother who stays at home. Exactly. Uh, even if they're not uh, really staying so home, they're still being that. Um, <laughs> you, you also um, um, write in, in, in uh, um, other essays that this um, craving for cliches and a very controlled um, kind of life also has to do with uh, fear for our own sexual energy. Um, and especially, um, you, you mention um, a difference in, in um, the way, for example, young writers, uh, young creative uh, uh, artists uh, deal with sexuality in, in their work. Uh, mm. and, and then you make a comparison, for example, with the writings of Updike and, and Roth that were uh, wildly uh, sexual. Could you, could you explain maybe a little bit what happened in, in the work of the younger generation of writers? Because you say there is also aggression in there, but it's... Mm somehow sure um, I, I feel like the this older generation of American no male novelists who are sort of the great American novelists of their generation Norman Mailer Philip Roth John Updike they wrote about sex and they wrote about affairs and they wrote about the like, comically tragically but sort of aggressively about these really explicit sexual situations that ended for good or for bad and sort of disrupted a lot of people's lives. And this new generation, which is more my generation, a little bit older, came of age in a kind of very liberal feminist period, and they felt like they had to be sensitive. And so they, they I sort of say in the book, I think I say, like they started to prefer the cuddle over sex. Like it was like they didn't feel comfortable with their own sexuality. This young American writer named Ben Kunkel, who sort of very, very fashionable and sort of ethereal, blonde, angel-looking boy <coughs> wrote this scene where he says, um, he kind of is thinking about making a pass at a girl, and he said, I would have thrown away my penis if I could. <laughs> and it's like that idea, that sort of ambivalence, like this exquisite, endlessly investigated ambivalence about their own sexuality, this irony, um, kind of endless reflecting narcissistic irony was just not the style of a Philip Roth who would not have thrown away his penis if he could. So, um, <clears throat> so I sort of contrast those, those two worlds. And, and I found, I don't think that the writers of my generation treat women better in their work or are less sexist. I don't think that's what we're looking at because they're quite sexist. I quote a line from Jonathan Franzen who has one of his female of one of his female characters in the corrections writes she was 31 and still beautiful <laughs> um, so I, you know which I submit is not the feminist utopia realized recently there was a, a, <coughs> a, an item on, on a news program and it was about um, re research um, how um, uh, young men um, how much they like to sleep 
or to date with elder women. And I thought, okay, now we are going to hear it. Now they are going to sleep with 50, year and, 50 years and 60 year olds, but they meant uh, uh, men of 25 sleeping with a woman of 30. 30. <laughs> <laughs> Really, really uh, uh, weird. Um, you, you, um, um, I would also like you to read from, from the essay, The Naked and the Conflicted, in which you particularly go into this kind of, of, of new uh, sexism and this, this, these young men that feel very ambivalent towards their own sexuality. And uh, because they cannot deal with the ambivalence, they just decide uh, uh, not to be sexual beings. Sure. Um, okay. And it starts... Passivity. Yes. <laughs> Passivity, a paralyzed sweetness, a deep ambivalence about sexual appetite are somehow taken as signs of a complex and admirable inner life. These are writers in love with irony, with the literary possibility of self-consciousness so extreme it almost precludes the minimal abandon necessary for the sexual act itself, an indirect rebellion against the wrath of Dyke and Bellow, their college girlfriends denounced. Recounting one such denunciation, David Foster Wallace says a friend called Updike, quote, just a penis with a thesaurus. This generation of writers is suspicious of what Michael Chabin in Wonder Boys calls, quote, the artificial hopefulness of sex. They are good guys, sensitive guys, and if their writing is denuded of a certain carnality, if it lacks a sense of possibility, of expansiveness, of the bewildering, transporting effects of physical love, it is because of a certain cultural shutting down, a deep, almost puritanical disapproval of their literary forebears and the shenanigans they lived through. In a vitriolic attack on Updike's Toward the End of Time, David Foster Wallace said of the novel's narrator, Ben Turnbell, that, quote, he persists in the bizarre adolescent idea that getting to have sex with whomever one wants, whenever one wants, is a cure for ontological despair, and that Updike himself, quote, makes it plain that he views the narrator's impotence as catastrophic, as the ultimate symbol of death itself, and he clearly wants us to mourn it as much as Turnbull does. I'm not especially offended by this attitude. I mostly just don't get it, end quote. In this same essay, Wallace goes on to attack Updike and in passing Roth and Mailer for being narcissists. But does this mean the new generation of novelists is not narcissistic? I would suspect narcissism being about as common among male novelists as brown eyes in the general public that it does not. It means that we are simply witnessing the flowering of a new narcissism. Boys too busy gazing at themselves in the mirror to think much about girls. Boys lost in the beautiful vanity of, quote, I was warm and wanted her to be warm, or the noble purity of being just a tiny bit repelled by the cruel advances of the desiring world. Thank you. Um, you, you seem to say here that um, somehow, um, young people, and uh, not, not only um, uh, male, uh, but also uh, uh, women, um, that they, they tend to deny uh, their, their own physicality and their own sexuality. Uh, you wrote, I believe it was in 1994, uh, a piece uh, called um, uh, The Morning After, uh, Sex, Fear, and Feminism, um, which gave rise, uh, I believe, to a lot of uh, hatred. <laughs> um, because uh, uh, back then, maybe, maybe you, you could tell us a little bit about the situation back then, because there was a, a date uh, rape going on on university campuses, and feminists were very worried uh, about that. And... Um, in your article and later in this book, um, you, you stated some other vision on, on women's sexuality. What, what? Well, what I really did was, it did make a lot of people mad, the book. It did also appear in Dutch, if you want to also be made mad. Um, <laughs> but do. It, um, it really wasn't, what I was saying was not that it, 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 rape was good. What I was saying was, that I took the college pamphlets being given out to young women, and there were some strange numbers in those pamphlets and some strange wording. So asking women questions, did you ever have sex with someone because a, man, a boy gave you drugs or alcohol? And I was just sort of pointing out, like, why is a 24-year-old, I mean, 21-year-old boy giving drugs and alcohol to the girl? Is she choosing to take them or is she not choosing? Why are we talking about women in this infantilized way? 
And I actually just wrote one piece, which became the whole book, where I compared the language in the date rape pamphlets being given out to college freshmen with Victorian guides to conduct for young ladies written in 1888. You know, and I just showed that they were quite similar when you just looked at the language. I just took out sentences and I compared them one, 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 one. And when I did that, it was sort of a critique of a certain kind of feminism that I felt was insulting to women, that I felt was taking away agency from these young women. And so the book was, I wrote it when I was 23 years old and it was the book of a 23 year old. But um, um, it, I was making a, a critique of a certain kind of feminism. But what I also was saying was that our political language um, is not adequate to convey the complexities of a lot of situations. And one of the things I talked about was that we're using words that aren't the right words for certain situations because we like the black and white of political language. And I was saying a lot of times there's something complicated that happens and it's too complicated for that political language. So that's what that book was about. Um, a little step from that book and female sexuality to uh, a small uh, YouTube uh, clip again. The third one, uh, Ton, about uh, leaving. Uh, it's a fragment from Eyes uh, Wide Shut, mm -hmm. a film uh, by Stanley Kubrick. Summer at Cape Cod? Yes. Do you remember one night in the dining room, there was this young naval officer, and he was sitting near our table with two other officers? <clears throat> no. The waiter brought him a message, which point he left. Nothing rings a bell. No. Well, I first saw him that morning in the lobby. He was, he was checking into the hotel and he was following the bellboy with his luggage to the elevator. He, he glanced at me as he walked past, just a glance. Nothing more. But I could hardly move. That afternoon, Helena went to the movies with her friend, and you and I made love. And we made plans about our future. And we talked about Helena. And yet, at no time, he ever out of my mind. And I thought if he wanted me, even if it was only for one night, I was ready to give up everything. You, Helena, my whole fucking future, everything. And yet it was weird because at the same time, you were dearer to me than ever. And, and at that moment, my love for you
was both tender and sad. I, I barely slept that night. I woke up the next morning in a panic. I didn't know whether I was afraid that he had left or that he might still be there. But by dinner, I realized he was gone. And I was Um, she ends this scene, she ends it by saying that she was relieved from her own desire. Um, I, I remember when uh, we watched uh, this movie, there was a lot of discussion uh, going on about um, uh, the fact that she had said that she was uh, able not only to leave her husband, but also... Uh, her child, which seems to attack the greatest fear of all human beings, that desire of women can be so strong that it will uh, uh, rupture their everyday life and even um, pull them away from the love of their children. You, you say in, in several pieces, you say that, it's, that you, you believe that, that it's possible that we tend to focus so much on, on children and on giving them a, a, a healthy, safe environment and almost becoming them or them becoming us to uh, have them act as a kind of safeguard for these kind uh, of desires. Yeah, it's funny watching that clip. I think that kind of feeling is so out of the ballpark of anything that any parents that I can think of would allow themselves to feel just because they, even to feel, let alone say, just to feel, because we are, I think that there is a way in which we use um, our current, not, not our children themselves, but our current forms of parenting as a way to avoid um, the pressures of adventure or the fear of restlessness or a lot of things in our own lives or frustration with one's work, whatever it is, we pour so much into, not into our children, because that's the wrong way to think about it, but into a certain kind of parenting in which it sort of takes over everything. And it's not about loving your children in a way that takes over everything. It's about parenting them in a way that takes over everything. So every day is about like the six birthday parties you're going to go to and the kid fair and the this and the that. So there is no actual adult life. I bring up um, in another essay, um, women who put pictures of their children or say sonogram images of their baby as their main profile picture on Facebook. So their whole identity is their children. Or, you know, when you go to a dinner party, as some of you in this age range will, might recognize where people, parents will just be talking the entire time about the schools their children go to or the ch relationship their nine-year-old has with their teacher or, and the whole conversation is about children as if there was not another thought in anyone's head. So that kind of eclipsing of adult life I write about. I also talk about, and I think in my essays on single motherhood I address this, I think, and I know it's a lot, it's very different here, but in America, our um, extreme stigma against single mothers and our suspicion of them, in, in America and the UK, I should say, is, is to, to a great extent about, some of it's like puritanical American ideas, manifesting as you know, psychological concern. But, um, but some of it is actually a discomfort with the idea that a woman can be a sort of sexual person kind of going on dates and also a mother. So the idea that you're two, those two things two. at once, yes, that you're somehow doing those two things at once and that you're trying to live your life outside of the accepted structure, which is the traditional family. And we really, in America, we were talking about this earlier, we don't, 
really have an idea of raising children outside of marriage. So the idea that you'd be with dating someone or living with somebody and have a kid together is not really acceptable to most mm -hmm. kind of mainstream American culture. That's considered pretty out there. A There's a, lo a lot life of choice. A lot of focus on getting married, yes. being married, getting which married is quite, being married. quite weird, I think, uh, to, to uh, Dutch people because um, the situation here is not not. Um, you can't compare it, I think, to, to America. There's not, not, not so much pressure here to get married, to, to be a married uh, a woman. It's a very weird uh, idea that so much focus goes into, uh, into that. They have these programs on TLC, uh, uh, perfect bride dress or, or something like that. And it's all um, connected with, with uh, being married. Where does that come from? Well, I think, again, it's, I mean, this is sort of one of the things I'm addressing at the heart of this book, which is our fundamental lack of tolerance for different ways of living your life, like different ways of putting together a life that don't look like the mm -hmm. traditional American family model from 1950. And so I think that we feel very anxious about any of those ways. And I should say in America, marriage is breaking down. So the reality in America is that... Um, 53% of babies born to women under 30 are born to single mothers. So that is the majority of babies being born to women under 30 are born to single mothers. So basically they're not married. Um, but we look at them as if they're raising their children in this exotic, freakish, terrible way because even though they are the majority of that mm -hmm. age group, and it's that disconnect that's strange. So the chasm is not... It, the, the idea of like the perfect wedding dresses on TV and this pressure to get married and, you know, and the idea that if you're not married, you've somehow failed at you know, this basic principle of life, um, that coexists with the fact that in middle class America, and there's a big class difference, so educate, college educated, upper middle class people do still get married in huge mm -hmm. high numbers. People with some college very early education age. at a very early age. But, but people with college, but without college educations or some college education don't largely get married. And so there's a class divide in terms of marriage, but our country still doesn't accept that you, know, you might, especially once you bring a child into the world, that it could be okay. It's not that they don't accept it, like they think it's difficult because it's hard to have money or there are more financial issues. That's not the issue. They just don't think it's okay. It's, it's a really pronounced stigma. It's much more acceptable to be a gay parent raising a kid in a couple than it is to be a single mom in America. I'm not sure why. You, you write in, the, in the, the first pieces of In Praise of Messy Life, you write about this experience of being uh, a single mother, of being uh, divorced, and the way that even uh, your most um, um, progressive uh, friends uh, still find a way to express their, their maybe uh, even their fear mm -hmm. that um, uh, you, you are there. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, um, I, I'm not sure if you still have time to, to watch it, but um, I, I remember um, a kind of horror movie uh, I have a little clip from it too, but maybe uh, we can watch, but only a small fragment of it, uh, called Dark Water, and it's about uh, a young mother with her uh, daughter, and they move in uh, into an apartment, and uh, everything around them um, breeds the atmosphere of, of danger, of loneliness, of something that it's not okay to be a single parent, and especially a single mother. Uh, with a child. Very dark and gloomy <laughs> colors. I think we picked the perfect place to live. Just perfect. <laughs> we have so much unpacking to do. You're gonna love it up here. We're two blocks from the school, which is one of the best in the city. Wait, sweetie, don't run, don't run! Get stuck in here, huh? Look, Mommy, I'm going to reach the ceiling. What's that? Um, just to show oh that God. there is this atmosphere uh, of, of danger. Yes, of, that of, is our fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but um, um, I can imagine uh, it, it was the, uh, the part of the uh, book that um, really made me feel uh, sad a little bit. Uh, there's also another uh, essay in which you write, and that also said me about the love child. Mm. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, I forgot the name of his uh, wife. Uh, Maria, at the time. Shriver. Maria Shriver. Maria um, Shriver. And Schwarzenegger um, uh, had had an affair with his housekeeper, mm. and and she got pregnant. And you write about um, the names we give uh, mm. uh, the children that are born out of um, mm. marriage, uh, out of wedlock, um, mm. and how society. Uh, continued to um, deal with the uh, children that were born uh, mm. out of the marriage as the real children mm. and uh, the one uh, uh, child from the housekeeper that was something else, it was not even a real uh, mm. child, it seemed. With a Yeah, actually, I, I, I tell the anecdote in the book about how... Um, when I was pregnant with my second baby and the father was kind of nowhere in sight at that point, someone was trying to convince me not to have this baby and he said to me, why don't you just wait and have a regular baby? <laughs> and it's like these little things, I mean, it's really not that far <laughs> from the, that, that. And it's the language, like, you know, in liberal progressive New York circles, nobody's gonna say that bastard child. They're not gonna use those words. But if you look at the definition of, of bastard, you will see that it, it includes the word irregular, a baby that is irregular. And another friend of mine who's a single mother had a baby and somebody said to her in that same way, um, you should just wait and have a real baby. She was like, this is a real baby. But um, I, I, one time, I didn't put this in the essay, I'm not sure why. I'm not, I don't, it belongs there, but somebody once said to me, um, you know, sort of a man I was seeing at the time, he, he turned to me and he said, um, and he's sort of a more cosmopolitan person who lives all over the world, and he said to me, um, you know, you're not living a dishonorable life. You're just working really hard and raising your kids. And I like burst into tears because I was like, it was such a revelation to me because so many people around me, including my own family, I hate to say, didn't say, it. Were, didn't say you're living a dishonorable <laughs> life, but they were making me feel like I was doing this crazy, wrong, freakish thing that I actually was suddenly like, I'm not living a dishonorable life, and I had to like do the math. I had to be like, actually, I really haven't done anything wrong. I'm bringing a child into the world and taking care of him, basically, and working really, really hard. So for me, and you know, again, um, and I feel like that moment was sort of a revelation for me because I was thinking, why do I feel like I'm doing something so dishonorable? And I, again, am lucky relative to a lot of people because I, li you know, I have the education I have and I have the job I have and you know, I, I have a lot of advantages that other people don't have, but I still, um, experience that stigma in so many ways, and it's really strange. J.K. Rowling, the author of Harry Potter, um, as mm -hmm. you know, has written really beautifully about being a single mother and about how people would um, kind of stare, say, make her feel like she was like lazy. You know, she was like this lazy, just trying to live off the government, you know, <laughs> sort of sponging off of society. And meanwhile, she's like working really hard, raising her child on her own, um, and, you know, getting up at 5 a.m. to write Harry Potter and, you know, again, becoming like a bajillionaire. And so we look at her as like maybe the opposite of a lazy single mother sponging off of society. And, you know, the fact that she felt that way for so long mm -hmm. um, is a sign of a certain, uh, the endurance of these ideas about, and not just single mothers, but people who have, I don't know, Kate Winslet, you know, three <laughs> kids with three different dads, or whatever it is, people who try to create a family structure that does not resemble the one we think that we're supposed to have. And, and do you have the idea that this is changing, or is it getting uh, even worse? Well, I think it's going to change, because I think that the realities of American life um, do not match our pervasive fantasies. And um, being America, we can live in that state for a surprisingly long time. But I think ultimately um, it will change. And I, I, my child, I was kind of concerned with my son. He's three. He was in his preschool class. And I was kind of concerned that he was going to feel bad that his family was so weird 
Like he has his dad, he has his sister's dad, the dads are around, his babysitter's around, there's like all the friends and aunties and people in his life and like what it, who, what does his family even look like? So I was concerned. They were doing like a little thing on families and they, the kids were asked to draw their families and so he, um, all the kids drew like mom, dad, sister, brother. Mom, dad, sister, sister, brother. Like that was their families. And then Leo starts to draw, he's like, there's my mom, there's my sister, there's my sister's dad, there's my dad, there's my babysitter, there's my grandma, <laughs> there's my other grandma, there's my, like, all, <laughs> like, there's the other woman, you know, there's my best friend's mom who's, like, in her house all the time. So when he started to do this, all the other kids were like, wait, my babysitter is part of my family, what about my grandma? And so all the other kids started to change their pictures into, like, suddenly there were, like, five people in their families, ten people in their families, and so the whole wall got cluttered, and I saw it myself, like, this whole wall where suddenly the families were just, like, this wild, crazy, messy drawings, and I felt like, you know, maybe. Well, I, I, I was very pleased in, in uh, what was reading your book because it, it um, brought back into my memory... Uh, my own youth, which was with a very chaotic, a very large family, and it took me, I think, till my 12 or 13 year to find out that some of the people that entered the house at certain times, that they were half brothers and half sisters, and not uncles or neighbors or aunts. And um, I have, uh, I had forgotten that. Um, it had also that uh, um, it also gave this uh, little sensation that it was not a proper family, that it was not right. And uh, in retrospect, I feel kind of sad that I looked at it um, uh, that way myself for such a long time. Um, so. Um, it's not not a pleasant sensation to um, stumble upon your own conservatism. Uh, and w when you when you uh, wrote about the messiness of of lives, you uh, um, yeah you give us all I think a sense of revelation. We 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 feel a bit liberated uh, with our own messiness. But at, at the same time, I think you couldn't have written it um, if there is not in you yourself also uh, this longing uh, for the conservative uh, life. Would you agree? Um, I think that that's true. And I think the book is definitely pitched in the conflict. So uh -huh. I, while I can recognize certain things I can see in myself, like this idea of conventional life, I question it and I think that I'm wrong to think about it, but obviously it's very dominant in my head. Or I wouldn't be writing about it. You're right, I would be interested in, you know, like wild white spotted owls or something. I would be doing something else. But, um, so definitely I am entranced by these ideas as much as anyone else is entranced by these ideas. And I think it's very hard to be alive in 2013 and not be in certain mm -hmm. cultures and not be entranced by these ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't blame the childish you or me for being entranced with those ideas because there's so many forces, like there's a million invisible forces, you know, kind of constantly pressuring us in those directions. But I, I also think I wrote the book um, to kind of I wrote the book to these like messy live friends that I thought existed in the world <laughs> that like I was reaching out to like talk to them. And so, and I do feel like it, I did connect to other people who I felt led, also led sort of messy lives and could kind of understand or sympathize with some bitter piece of what I was writing about. So, you know, and the book is not about me, basically. Very little of it's about me. Um, it's mostly about other stuff. But, um, but I did sort of write it with that idea um, and I think it is part of what I'm trying to do in the book is not say my life is good because I don't even know if it is, but um, to say that we should have more imagination about the possible ways to live your life and just sort of open up the idea of what is a good life and what are kind of acceptable ways and not reproach ourselves all the time for not having the orderly or the perfect life. Um, I think that's a, a, a wonderful point to, to, to stop our... Uh, a conversation and um, um, go into the questions uh, uh, 
of the audience. There are uh, um, big parts of your book that we uh, uh, didn't uh, talk about. Um, it's not uh, only about single mothers, sexuality, uh, and our uh, ambiguities and, and uh, problems with it. Um, um, before, sorry, before we go into the questions, what also struck me was that um, you give this space for more um, acceptance of, of uh, uh, lives that are less controlled, but at the same time you um, seem to have uh, one big law for a writer and that is to be not messy, to be as accurate mm. uh, and as uh, clear uh, and secure as you can be when you write about these ambiguities and when you write about these uh, kind of things. You don't allow any kind of writer to get away with uh, uh, messy opinions. Mm. Um, so that, was, that really struck me because that's... that's uh, um, um, yeah, you know, one one of the, the the things that are very very clear, that I got very clear from it, um, you know, the way you write about uh, the internet and the angry uh, commenter, uh, for example, you see more angry because of the lack of of uh, appropriate language or skills mm -hmm. than uh, yeah, because of his his or her her angriness itself. Um, okay, that, <laughs> that's just a remark. Um, so, so let's go uh, into some uh, questions of, uh, of the audience. Um, I was very excited to um, come and hear you speak because I used to quote you when I was teaching photography in London about 15 years ago. So. A lot of students have heard your very succinct and non-messy um, <laughs> observations about photography. Um, I, I've got an observation and a question for you. Um, my observation is that um, uh, I've just come back from the Venice Biennale. And uh, one of the exciting things for me, because I do lots of drawings about female sexuality, is that I think messiness um, seems to be quite prevalent in contemporary art. I'm thinking of Paul McCarthy, Antonio Tapies, and other artists. It seems as if it's um, uh, legitimate to be uh, messy in that domain, perhaps more so than in writing. That's my observation. My question is, um, I, um, I lead an almost perfect life. I've got book contracts, I've got... Um, a really lovely husband I've been in with, with for 20 years, got family and friends, I haven't got children, but I've got, you know, everything's really nice to live in Amsterdam, beautiful city. Um, but I'm overweight. And that's one thing <laughs> that I find really difficult, that um, I feel guilty about. And um, when, I, when you were speaking, I was thinking about Susan Sontag's essay, Illness as Metaphor, and how we tend to narrativize and judge other people when their bodies are not perfect, when they're ill, overweight, sick, um, and, um, uh, and often some artists are starting to look at that in their work as well. Um, so my question is, um, because I haven't read your book, I look, look forward to reading it, is about um, guilt and perhaps images of women's bodies um, as not being perfect, um, in particular, when I've been in America, overweight women in America and the messiness of, of, of that and what that says about people's judgment of others. Mm. Um, I think that's a really good question. I actually have an essay in here about Susan Sontag, just as a side issue. <laughs> but um, I, I do think that that is a good example. In America, we talk a lot about obesity and it becomes this issue. I think in America, we use the word healthy often as a sort of repressive word. So, so a lot of other judgments masquerade in this thing when we say people are being unhealthy. Now, I'm not saying it's healthy to be obese because I'm not actually making that claim. 
But there have been some recent interesting studies in the New York Times just ran an article about how certain kinds of obesity are fine. There was just this New York Times like scientific study that we, our, our idea that anybody who's a little bit overweight is unhealthy is really <laughs> not true. And there are some good kinds of unhealthy and that some people just have a different metabolism and it's fine. So some of that is in the science. But I, I do think this idea of of seeking after this perfect appearance, which obviously has been much written about. And I see it, I mean, I heard my 10-year-old, like, stick-thin child the other day say that she didn't want to put on a down vest because it would make her look fat. 10 years old, like, stick-thin. I just don't want to wear that. It's going to make me look fat. And I'm thinking, like, she's 10. I think she said that when she was 9. And it's, uh, it's not even about what your body actually looks like. Your body can look any way, and there'll be like 10,000 people judging it in 10,000 different ways. So the idea, one of the problems with the idea of, of perfection or unmessiness is that nobody reaches that standard, no matter what. So that you could be overweight or not overweight, you're still going to feel like some part of you is not conforming to this, this conception. And I think some of our, it's meant to be effortless, you're meant to just fall into this perfection, you know, and, and have it, you know, not work for it or anything. But it's, it's again, I think part of, what, among the many things that I write about in this book that um, we're wasting our energy on, and one of the messages of this book we didn't really get to today, but it's sort of like life is too short. Um, I have Andrew Marvell, you know, at my back. I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. It's like, we're going to die. Like, why spend five minutes worrying about this stuff? So... That's one of the messages I have in this book, and I think that does fit in to this conversation. I think hearing you has helped me feel less guilty about being not perfect. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's other questions? Okay, misschien wil je me helpen met vertalen. Ik. Uh, we hadden een paar weken geleden een... Uh, she will help me translate. Yes, Oké, okay, dat is fijn. Ja, dat is altijd de question. Is dat goed? Ja. Yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, een paar weken geleden hadden we die zaak met een uh, man die via internet probeerde yeah. meisjes uit de kleren te yeah. krijgen. En uh, ik merkte op mijn eigen timeline op Twitter dat heel veel jonge meisjes zich eraan stoorden. Uh, dat meisjes alleen maar gewaarschuwd worden mm -hmm. voor uh, seks op internet en uh, daarmee niet als... Volwassen worden gezien dat wij ze moeten beschermen. Er en ik vraag me af hoe zij daarover denkt. Ja, er was een. Uh, um, uh, how do you say? Uh, um, on the internet, um, apparently, uh, some, some, some guy was. Um, uh, they call it grooming. Uh, was, was seducing uh, 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 young girls from age 10 till, till 17 on the internet, you know, to, to uh, send pictures uh, mm. uh, uh, being naked uh, or um, 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 to perform sexual acts. And um, this guy, uh, um, okay, uh, uh, of course, he was immediately... Um, um, how do you say? Uh, 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 um, what's he called? Was he arrested? Yes. Uh -huh. um, but um, your question was: a lot of girls they they um, uh, didn't feel okay with the idea that they were just being uh, uh, not not uh, uh, the girls that he had uh, um, uh, talked to, but a lot of other young girls they didn't like the idea that they were being victimized, uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, as if there's no other way to um, uh, to show your sexuality or to become an er erotic being than uh, being victimized. Um, and mm. your question was, what do you, what's your opinion about that? That we only warn them, look out, uh, older men. Mm -hmm. It's a tricky issue because obviously it's sort of terrifying if you think about children, you know, I mean, obviously there's terrifying real safety issues involved and I wouldn't want to underestimate that. Mm. That said, um, I think it is true that we tend to collapse power issues. This goes back to your, we like to think in cliches. So the cliche of this thing is gonna be appealing to us, even if it's not always true. Of, let's say there's a 17-year-old who feels whatever, 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 that might not be her story. And often the narratives don't fit into the, into the sort of news story that we like to, you know, the kind of tap, trashy news story we like to circulate around. I recently did a piece on the philosopher Colin McGinn, this British philosopher. He was 
um, resigned from a very, very, very famous philosopher all over the news in America. He resigned from his job, at tenured position at University of Miami in a, faculty, in a philosophy department because he apparently sexually harassed a student. And I actually got obtained, and I can't say how, the emails between him and this student and the text messages between him and the student. And what the story, which I wrote at great length, was much more complicated because actually they were having a whole relationship. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the university had never even charged him with sexual harassment because they had seen these same emails and they knew that it wasn't sexual harassment. They charged him with having a relationship and not reporting it, which is against the rules in American universities. But the New York Times and other reputable publications all wrote that he had sexually harassed this girl. And it was really strange because it became the news. It was like it became real because we much could much more understand that idea that there was sexual harassment rather than the much weirder idea, which is this <laughs> famous old guy got weirdly enchanted with this young woman who was in a very warm reciprocal relationship with him. They never slept together, but it was two-sided. And that idea was too complicated. It was like, where are you gonna put that in the New York Times? What section does that go in? And we just can't understand those stories. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm kind of trying to argue in this book against the reductionism of that kind of thinking. Um, and I, you know, obviously it's tricky because you, sometimes there are victims and sometimes we have to say that there are victims. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that our, one of the errors of the feminist movement um, in my mind has been to over employ a victim terminology to, the, to an extent that's actually insulting or infantilizing or condescending to women of all ages. Sorry. Hello. Uh, I didn't read your uh, book or other books, um, but um, I have a question about um, um, what's the reaction of the black community, the women in uh, the USA, about your book? Because um, 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 I know that. Uh, um, a lot of um, black women raise their child, mm. their children, without a dad, without mm. uh, fathers. Um, do you have received reactions um, of that community I about have your actually, ideas? I have, it's interesting. I've been writing a lot about single mothers, not just in the book. I wrote a defense of single motherhood in the New York Times in which I questioned some of the studies people use to say single motherhood is bad for children, and I pointed out that financial insecurity is bad for children, which these studies do show, but there is not one single study that shows that being a single, having a single mother is bad, absent financial stress. And um, so I wrote that in the New York Times, and I've written several other articles about single motherhood, both in The Guardian and London and in the New York Times and other places. And I've gotten a huge response. People keep saying to me, like, you're just living this weird life because you have, you're not a typical single mother. To which I kind of say there is no typical single mother because single mothers can be divorced mothers raising kids on their own. They can be somebody whose father died. They can be living in all different circumstances. And so the term itself is sort of a fiction um, and betrays its own set of prejudices. But I have received a lot, a lot, a lot of mail from people in the black community um, saying that they're happy that I'm writing these things because it seems like I'm writing really basic, probably to you, kind of obvious stupid pieces, but they're just, they haven't been, I mean, about single motherhood. I think it's very obvious. My defense of single motherhood, I make some pretty obvious points, but they just haven't been made in the New York Times. Um, and so I have gotten a huge response, and I, I was pleased because the response was from people raising their kids in a lot of different kinds of circumstances, so not just African-American women, but also, you know, people who, in all different kinds of social and economic situations, people in the Midwest, people in California, people in all different places, and I feel that they had really similar experiences to mine. So all these people were saying, this is just you, and you're, like, you're a little oversensitive. Why do you care if someone said you should have a real baby? You know, people are sort of thinking it's all in my head. Um, but when I got this huge response, I realized it's not all in my head. You know, I can say, like, you know, check out these, these 750 emails I got after this piece. Um, and that tells me that, that in that community, and there are a lot of women who have been writing about this, you know, novels or, you know, 
over for a long time. Um, but I think it's it's it, it's to me important to look at the fact that there's not, we have these cliches or these fantasies about what a single mother is, and they just they re, that that person doesn't exist. Like these, this cliche we have in our head of who the single mother is, there's like a lot of single mothers, and they look really different. Thank you. Okay. I'm just not really sure what the messy in the book is. Do you mean you say, because you had a short discussion at the beginning about the difference between messy and sloppy. Mm. I think I have that quite clear in my head. Um, <laughs> but actually what you mean when you say what, what the messiness that you're in defense of or in praise of in mm. your book, I, I'm still a little bit unclear about. Okay. Um, the messiness is um, a lot of different things. The messiness, and I, and I mean it to be pretty expansive because the essays are all about really different things. So on the one hand, when I talk about um, our attitudes toward divorced people as if they've failed at this very important thing, which is marriage, our attitude towards single mothers, like how, how, why have you inflicted this compromised life upon this poor, blighted infant? Um, our attitudes toward people who, who dr have three drinks. So is it okay to go to a party and have three drinks? Is it okay if you, don't, you are in six relationships in the course of your life, not one relationship in the course of your life? Is that messy? Some people view that as messy. So what I'm arguing in praise of is all the different ways in which people live outside of the acceptable, dominant, bourgeois construction of a healthy, enlightened, or good life. And there are a lot of those ways. I mean, as you can see, it could be like, you know, feeding M&Ms to your kid in the stroller. I mean, it could be a lot of different things where you're just overstepping the bound a tiny little bit. Um, and so the messiness is, and, and you know, in the truth, you kind of isolate something, which is my life's not that messy. Like my idea that I'm some kind of weird bohemian, it's like I'm not a weird <laughs> bohemian. I'm like so leading such a tame, kind of pathetically orderly life in a way. I think you're right to point that out if that's what you're saying. Um, you know, I'm a professor, I have a job, I have like three jobs, I, yes. So I do live a very orderly life, but the fact that I, that, I, that even I have to defend messiness, like even I feel like I'm this weird bohemian, will tell you just how powerful those dominant ideas are. Are there any other questions? Um, it's about your article in the Volkskrant, uh, Volkskrant uh, of Saturday. It's a piece about women that um, use their family of, or um, because they have children, they don't choose to have a, a career or pursue mm -hmm. a career. Uh, in my job, uh, we are starting a campaign to make women aware of uh, if they only have a part-time job when they have children or they stop working uh, when they have children that after 15 years perhaps they won't be able to start a career mm. or when their husbands leave them uh, they won't be um, able to uh, have a good financial life or their, their lives will change. Um, we often say this, be aware of your own uh, work and start a career and not just because you have children you have to stop mm. working. Uh, but we find a lot of resentment or people are angry because if you do work, you're probably not taking good care of your children. Mm. Uh, do you have, a, not advice, but what could I say that could change their minds or may, make them more aware of uh, certain choices that they make when they start a family? I think that's a great question. I mean, I. It, and I, I don't know that there's an answer to it. Um, the New York Times recently ran an art, a really long article about women trying to go back into the workplace, just what you're talking about, and not being able to. You know, these sort of people who thought that they were just going to take a couple of years off and then completely could not re-enter. And obviously, we live in a difficult economic time, so the people who step out of work um, have trouble stepping in. Uh, I. 
I would also say there, there have been a bunch of studies um, done in America recently. Um, there are always these studies, but there's recently been a new batch of them that have been pretty convincing. And again, they test, are children of working mothers suffering? And what, constantly they're, they're constantly testing it, but the newest batch of these studies has shown, and the Times just did another article on this, that the children of working mothers are, surprise, surprise, not suffering, <laughs> and actually doing better than the children of stay-at-home mothers. And one of these studies also recently talked about depression and the higher instances of depression in stay-at-home mothers, um, and that in terms of and, and some of the perf perfect mothering I'm writing about in this book are coming from people who've given up their careers and have maybe focusing all their energy onto this idea of parenting that they might have been focusing in another point in time onto, onto taking care of the kids. <coughs> I would also say um, taking care of your kids full time is a huge luxury that only the tiniest percentage of people can afford. And not being independent and not being able to earn a living and not being able to make money is pretty um, crippling because people get divorced, for instance. Um, and one thing is, I think it's something that women in the 20s have been, have been writing about. I mean, people, feminists have been writing about this for a really long time. That just, it doesn't mean your marriage isn't gonna last, but being able to support yourself and having that ability to have economic independence is really important. And it also helps the marriage. <laughs> it also helps the marriage. Well, one of the things about this New York Times article that a lot of these stay-at-home mothers were writing about, and again, I don't want to condemn anybody's choices of what to do, and I've left my children in Amsterdam, and they're in New York City, and they're suffering right now. So I'm <laughs> condemning nobody's choices. But um, I would say that um, a lot of these women in these, just to your point, a lot of these women in this recent New York Times article were like, he was earning all the money, but yet he wanted me to cook dinner every night. Like they were getting outraged that these men thought that they should take care of the house when sort of that's what the deal is. Like if you surrender all your economic independence, then the power dynamic of the relationship reflects that. And it seemed to me really weird that they were so outraged and surprised by this, that these men were like, but he's not being an equal parent. Well, of course he's not being an equal parent because he's at the bank all day and you're <laughs> home being the parent. So. If you want equality, like most of these women actually do, you have to look at the fact that even though it's kind of awful to say, in human relationships, these questions of who is supporting the family actually they do create power imbalances. And I think just psychologically, um, that's something to think about as well. And also maybe um, it's so easy. I remember thinking back of my parents, uh, my father earned the money, and my mother was a housewife, and maybe with 13 children, it was really difficult not, not to be. But I, I remember as a, as a child, um, it, it saddened me that they didn't know anything uh, about each other's lives, about the re reality of it. And of course, I was also raised uh, in, in, uh, with feminism, and um, uh, so in the early years, I focused more on my mother's anger that my father didn't do this or didn't do that or didn't deal with the children the way she liked. And only later on I realized that um, she had no idea what my father was doing and the demands that um, were made to him uh, in, the, in the outside world and that it was not all partying and uh, happy uh, working uh, outside of the house, so I also think it 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 makes people very lonely if you have really no idea, um, yeah, what your work consists of. Yeah, and I, and I think you, Betty Friedan wrote about this in the Feminine Mystique, and I still I assign it to my undergraduates, even though it's a book from so long ago, it's mm -hmm. still actually relevant to them to look at it again because it addresses these exact questions you're talking about. And I think one of the just one last thing. One of the fallacies in thinking of this new generation is that they are feminists. So they think we live in an equal world. So we can. But the reason we, we live in an equal world is because women are working. That's why we live in an equal world. If women aren't working, if let's say all of us suddenly stopped working and <laughs> stayed home and only vacuumed and took care of the kids, we would no longer live in an equal world. And so a lot of these women have this idea that the equal world exists in their home even though they're not working and that's the fallacy because the feminism that we have is sort of vulnerable and fragile and kind of case by case 
So not everybody lives in this feminist utopia, only the people who kind of seize it. And I, and I do think how that works in a household, um, it's, it's one of these lessons that I guess each generation has to keep learning over and over again. I can't help to think that the same goes for democracy, uh, that we also all grew up with it and tend to think that, okay, it's there and uh, we don't have to worry about it, we can't lose that. Um, uh, but it's something you still uh, always have to, yeah, to regain and, and, and to take care of. Um, we are reaching uh, the end of, of uh, this interview. Uh, maybe if there is just one last uh, a, a question for someone who really feels sad and bad if he can't ask this. Uh, is there such a last question? You are talking about um, the children who are overprotected. Uh, they are grown overprotected. And um, I'm, I'm wondering what, what is their reaction going to be when they grow up? Like, you, the, uh, the generation after Mad Men, like your mother or your sister, you, you were different than your sister, but how is, how is the reaction going to be of the children of now who are, going to, who are only getting organic food or <laughs> who can't can, can fall down, who can, who can go alone to, the, yeah. to school by bike? That's a, I think that's a really good question. I think that our, our hovering over our children is going to create a certain kind of child. I'll just tell one quick story. One of my friends um, was going to the south of France to visit her mother, had a, cat, a cottage, like a villa with a stone floor, and she shipped a thousand dollars worth of rubber flooring to the, to, to the cottage, to the villa, so that her child wouldn't fall. And you just have to worry about that child because you can't protect your child from falling. You just can't. So this impossible perfection, what kind of children are we creating and can they become independent? There was an American psychologist who said a great thing and then I'll end. Um, she said, her name is Madeline Levine, she said there should be three, at least three years between when your child is first allowed to cross a street on their own and when they're using a condom. <laughs> and I just thought that was a really great way to formulate this particular problem we're having now. Great. <laughs> Uh, Katie, thank you very much thank for you. your uh, answers to the questions and for the conversation. Um, we uh, both will sign uh, our books, I think, uh, over there. Um, but bef before we end, I have to say um, there uh, um, will be uh, a next edition of uh, the series with uh, John Palahiri <laughs> in gesprek met Tanya Yatnan Nansing. Uh, op donderdag 31 oktober. En uh, tomorrow um, uh, you can hear uh, Katie uh, in Spui 25 uh, in Amsterdam, where she will talk with uh, Simone van Sarloos. And that was a journalist who also uh, did the interview in the Volkskrant. So if you uh, want to know a little bit more, because we really didn't go uh, <laughs> into all the... <laughs> All the essays of the book, um, there, um, you have another chance. Het is uitverkocht, hoor ik net morgen. Dus dat, uh, okay. <laughs> Sold out, <laughs> so... Uh, ja. Mensen yeah. moeten het boek lezen, denk ik. Yeah. Dat you, have to read, you will have to read a book, but <laughs> that's no punishment. And also, um, um, I have to say, um, it will take a while, a couple of days, but if you want to um, review, uh, 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 not to review, but to see again um, uh, this interview, uh, you can, and, and, and other uh, uh, interviews in uh, this series, you can go to www.youtube.com slash bibliotheek.tv en daar kun je van alles terugzien. Heb ik ook gedaan en dat is uh, zeer de moeite waard. Oké, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.